Morning, everyone. Uh, Louise, thank you for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming to listen. So without further ado, I'll crack on. So we love fluids, don't we, in a hospital? Almost every patient who comes to hospital gets some IV fluid at some point. And it's not rocket science. Fluids are for two things. So if patients have lost fluids, we need to replace them, and we call that resuscitation. And if patients are unable to eat and drink, then we need to give them their daily water requirements and their daily electrolyte requirements. And maintenance is really easy, because all you have to do is remember the number one. You need one mil per kilo per hour of water and one millimole per kilo per day of sodium and potassium. So if we give fluids so much, and if they're so easy, then why do we do it so badly? NICE tell us that one in five patients come to harm from fluid mismanagement, either from too much fluid, not enough fluid, the wrong fluid, electrolyte abnormalities. How does this happen? If you do an audit in your hospital, you'll probably find data like this. Most patients on IV fluids in your hospital will actually be eating and drinking. Most of them won't be getting any potassium. You'll find hypokalemic patients not getting any potassium. And you'll even find some quite severely hypernatremic patients not getting their daily water requirements. And if you go and ask fluid prescribers, most of them don't have a clue what's in the IV fluid they prescribe. They don't know what the patient's daily requirements are. And they have no idea about fluid volumes. So what's your normal blood volume? What's your normal ECF volume? Most people just don't know. And we task fluid prescribing, don't we, usually, to the most junior member of the team, who's often not had much training in fluid management. And what do they do? The nurse hands them a drug card, and they copy the bag of fluid that the patient got last. And when they do that, we end up with situations like this. OK, so this is a post-surgical patient, relatively minor surgery. The anaesthetist has written on the chart a bag of fluid which can be stopped when the patient's drinking. And look what happens. Over the next three days, the patient gets all that salty fluid. So that adds up to 102 grams of salt. That's nearly 300 bags of crisps in three days. So in evolutionary terms, we are wired or made to hold on to sodium really well. Back in ancient times, salt was in short supply, and we're really good at holding on to it, but we're not good at getting rid of it. And couple this with the fact that the stress response from surgery activates mechanisms to make you hold on to salt and water, and then add on top of that the fact that when you're giving salty water, it doesn't activate osmoreceptors, and so there's no impetus to pee the fluid out, and you end up with patients massively fluid overloaded. Patients like this one, who ended up becoming critically ill and coming to ICU because of terrible fluid prescribing. And that is completely unacceptable. And this happens all too often. Salt water drowning. So why is this going so wrong? Where are we going wrong? I've shown you an example of poor prescribing of maintenance fluids, but often it's resuscitation fluid that leads us into problems as well. So people think that when patients have any of these things, the answer for it is fluids. And this is a typical scenario. Patient comes into hospital, bit of abdominal pain, gets a CT scan, mild pancreatitis, gets admitted. Five days later, you get a referral from the surgeon saying, oh, this patient's deteriorating, they've got acute respiratory failure, they've got an acute kidney injury, we've re-CT'd them and their pancreas is really edematous now. You know, their pancreatitis is getting really bad. We've, we've done all the right things, but the pancreatitis is really bad. They've got ARDS. And you go and have a little cry in the sluice and then you admit the patient and you give them loads of diuretics or if the renal function is really bad, you filter them, and 48 hours later, when you've got all that fluid off, the organ dysfunction goes away, and you discharge the patient to the ward, 
with strict instructions not to get any further IV fluid. And when you talk to people about why they're giving fluids for patients like that, ultimately they'll probably say, well, we want to make sure their organs are perfused better. So we're going to take a little look at this for a few minutes. Now, we all, all know, don't we, that fluid flow occurs down a pressure gradient. And the input pressure for a capillary bed uh, is the arterial pressure, and that's opposed by the compartment pressure, if any exists in the organ, and venous pressures. So we're going to take a look at each one of these in turn and see how fluids affects these and affects organ perfusion. And we'll start with arterial pressure. Now we know, don't we, that um, there's auto-regulation for cap capillary beds. The arterioles auto-regulate the flow in the organ. So for an organ like the kidney, as long as you've got a mean arterial pressure between 60 and, say, 180, the perfusion is going to be constant. So as long as you're above a minimum mean pressure, there's not really anything you can do from the arterial side of the circulation to improve organ perfusion. So how could fluids be beneficial in improving organ perfusion with a normotensive patient? 99.9% .9 of the time. Okay, fair enough. What if you've got a hypovolemic patient? We'll give them some fluid, we'll increase preload, increase cardiac output and blood pressure. Happy days. Um, but do fluids actually do this? And the answer is, it depends. So we know, don't we, that venous return is determined by the pressure gradient from our venules to our right heart. And you can call that venular pressure or mean systemic pressure or stressed volume. It's all the same thing. And that pressure in our venules is determined by just two things, the volume within them and their compliance. So of course, if the volume is reduced, if the patient's hypovolemic, then you'll have reduced venous return reduced cardiac output, potentially low blood pressure. But we need to remember that hypovolemia is only caused by a couple of things. GI losses, diarrhea, vomiting, stoma losses, or bleeding. And these should be pretty obvious from the history, or the blood on the floor, or the blood in the surgical drains. Here's a hypovolemic patient that presented to uh, our emergency department. Interesting blood gas for lots of reasons. So a uh, patient had been vomiting severely for several days, and you can see here there's hypovolemic shock from vomiting. Look, all those numbers are interesting, but look particularly at the hemoglobin. Hemoconcentrated because of low fluid volume. Also a hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis and an alkalemia despite the lactate of 13, which is quite impressive, isn't it? So hypovolemic patient needed fluid resuscitation. Now, hypovolemic patients do come to hospital, obviously, like that one. Patients come in, they've not been eating and drinking much for a few days, they've had some vomiting and diarrhea, but what happens when they get into the ED department? Get some fluid, don't they? Everyone gets some oxygen, everyone gets some fluid, and if they're obviously hypovolemic, then they get a bit more fluid. So by the time a patient gets into a hospital bed, uh, on the ward or in your ICU, it's very unlikely they're going to be hypovolemic. And in fact, you're probably almost as likely to find a unicorn in a hospital bed as you are a hypovolemic patient. Now, people get a bit confused by uh, vasodilated patients. And People sometimes say that they've got a relative hypovolemia, which is a term I particularly dislike. And they're saying that because they're vasodilated, the stressed volume goes down, venous return goes down. And it might sound reasonable to think, well, OK, I could just put some more fluid back in, in the system, and that will increase the stress volume and increase venous return. But unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. And we know that from evidence. If you're interested, those QR codes will take you to a couple of papers. But we also know it from our clinical practice. So if you're an anaesthetist as well as an intensivist, and you give someone a spinal anaesthetic, their blood pressure drops, and you give them a fluid bolus, and not much happens, does it? So what do you actually do? You give them some metaraminol, and that increases the stress volume, increases the venous return and the blood pressure, and 30 seconds later, the patient is better. 
Okay, so with normal tensive patients, fluids aren't going to help. With vasodilated patients, fluids aren't going to help. They'll only help with hypovolemic patients, and they are not very common. So what about compartment pressures then? And by this, what I'm really talking about is edema. And to understand edema formation, we have to understand what happens when we give patients fluids. So here's a graph of filtration out of capillaries into the interstitium by capillary pressure. And if you're hypovolemic, you have low capillary pressures. And when your capillary pressures are low, filtration out of vessels ceases. Okay? And when you give somebody some replacement fluid, and that might be a glass of water, a cup of tea, a bag of saline, whatever, all that fluid will stay in the vessels until capillary pressures come up to the point of euvolemia, when a patient is normovolemic. So all the fluid stays in the vessels. Then once you get to normovolemia, if you give any more fluid, you hit this inflection point called the J point. And if you give enough, you'll overwhelm lymphatic return and the patients become edematous. So fluid stays in the vessels until normovolemia, but after normovolemia, when you get to hypovolemia, nearly all the fluid leaks out into the tissues. And edema is really bad for patients. We see the puffy legs and stuff like me and think, oh, well. But if a patient is edematous on the outside, then they're edematous on the inside. And that means encephalopathy, uh, pulmonary edema, gut failure, acute kidney injury, et cetera, et cetera. And it's particularly bad in encapsulated organs like the kidneys, where they can't expand and the pressure will go up more than in other organs. So if you're causing patients to become edematous, you're causing organ impairment. What about venous pressures? Well, I showed you this illustration earlier saying that arterial pressure was the driving pressure for organ perfusion, and that's not quite true. Or what, what I really mean is it's arteriolar pressure that's the input pressure for organ perfusion. And we know, don't we, that as uh, you get down to the arteriolar capillary interface, pressure has dropped significantly. So we're down to about 35 millimeters of mercury at this point. So if you've got arterial pressure here or arteriolar pressure here and venous pressure here, they're not that far away. And I've said already that there's nothing you can do about this bit, about the arteriolar pressure, because it's also regulated. So venous pressures then become the main determinant for organ perfusion. And we've known about this since 1861. Here's an article from 1931, but it references something from 1861. But it seems to have been forgotten about until more recently. Now, do fluids increase venous pressures? And the answer is you have to go pretty crazy with IV fluids to increase venous pressures. Veins and our right heart are quite compliant, so they can increase in volume without much increase in pressure. But we're good at going crazy with fluids, aren't we? And here is a figure from showing you the relationship between fluid volume administered and central venous pressure in the early goal-directed therapy trials. So you give people enough fluid, yes, most leaks out into the tissues, uh, and yes, the right side is compliant, but some fluid does stay in the vessels, and venous pressures do increase when you go mad. So remember when we used to follow the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines to go for a central venous pressure of 8 to 12? We thought we were targeting organ perfusion. And in fact, what we were really targeting was venous con congestion and impairing organ perfusion. And that's why when I was learning ultrasound as a trainee, almost every patient I scanned on the intensive care unit had images like this. Dilated right hearts, pericardial effusions, pulmonary edema, pleural effusions, even ascites. And if you look at the first two echo images, top left and middle, you can see the right side of the heart is big and that it's squashing the left heart. So you've got a double whammy here. You've got high right-sided pressures, which means high venous pressures. 
but because of the constraints of the pericardium, that means you get something called ventricular interdependence. So the left ventricle is squashed, and it's, out, it's filling, and its output is going to be reduced. So you've got poor perfusion from the arterial side and increased back pressure from the venous side. And there's lots and lots of evidence coming out now showing the link between high venous pressures and both acute kidney injury and mortality. So, how do we avoid harm and how do we prescribe fluids in a rational way? The maintenance, I've told you, is easy, isn't it? We've already, I've already said this. You just remember the number one. Patients need their daily water requirement and they need some electrolytes. There's no excuse for them not getting enough water. And we need to remember what causes hypovolemia. And when patients do have significant GI losses, and that might be stoma losses on the surgical ward, might be vomiting or diarrhea, lost blood, ultimately those things are going to need replacing. And this is what we should be doing. So when patients are hypovolemic, we need to replace that lost fluid, but we need to make sure we don't overdo it. And there's lots of stuff coming out, or has come out recently, about de-resuscitation. Okay, if you're de-resuscitating somebody, you've already gone too far. You've already caused harm. Okay, so of course you need to de-resuscitate if you've overdone it, but we shouldn't get to that point in the first place. Patients need to be you bulimic. I also just want to mention, coming to the end here, which patients we should be focusing on. So there's been various trials over recent years comparing uh, balanced crystalloids versus saline, or we've had two very recent trials that comparing um, more restrictive amounts of fluid resuscitation in the early phases. And trials like this are never going to show any difference in mortality. Let's face it, when a patient first presents to hospital, if they get 500 mils of fluid or a litre or even two litres, it just doesn't really matter, does it? Usually. Usually. Um, it'd be very different, difficult to show a difference between those things. We've demonstrated that lower volumes are safe with these trials, um, but you, they're, so, you're sort of testing the wrong thing maybe. What we really need to focus on is the patients who are in hospital for days and who get prescribed fluid in an incorrect way and end up like this. So patients who get so fluid overloaded just from sitting in a ward bed that they become critically ill and come to the intensive care unit. That is unacceptable. It drives me mental really important. Okay, so Andy and Marcia are going to tell us how we go about fixing this in our hospitals. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, then please do follow me on Twitter or YouTube and uh, have a safe trip home later, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.